Lord, to whom else shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. Amen. The text that I would lay upon your hearts this morning come from John chapter 16. We'll be reading verses 16 through 24. A little while, and you will see me no longer, and again a little while, and you will see me. So some of his disciples said to one another, What is this he says to us? A little while, and you will not see me, and again a little while, and you will see me, and because I am going to the Father. So they were saying, What does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he is talking about. Jesus knew, what, or Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him, so he said to them, is this what you are asking yourselves? What I meant by saying, a little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me? Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. In that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. So far God's holy word. Dear friends in Christ, fellow redeemed, one of the joys of being a parent is being able to play games with your children and see their, their happy reactions to those games. One of the games that many of us play with infants is where you take their hands and you say, so big, and you stretch their arms up, and you put them back together, so big, and you stretch them up again. The real fun of this game is later on, after your children start to catch on, and you can just walk by, and they're doing something else on the ground, and you say, so big, and immediately their arms shoot up into the air. They have a big smile on their face, and it gives you a big smile as well. There's another game that many people play with infants. In fact, I'm pretty certain probably all of us have played this. It's a game that seems to be described in our text. I'm going to read some words from Jesus, and you let me know if... This reminds you of any early childhood games that you've played. Jesus says, A little while, and you will see me no longer. And again a little while, and you will see me. Peekaboo. Sounds a lot to me like, Peekaboo, I see you. According to experts, this one game is actually played everywhere in the world. Doesn't matter what country or culture you are in, Parents in that place will play peekaboo with their children. It's a universal game. Experts also say it's a very important game. It teaches children some important truths about life. That reality is not determined by what you see. Or rather, some things continue to exist even when you can't see them there and even when you can't sense them. So mommy and daddy, even if they're in another room, they still exist. Even if they have to go to the bathroom and they shut the door, it's not the end of the world. You don't have to cry. They're going to come right back out. This whole lesson that we learned through the game of peekaboo is called object permanence. The idea that the world is not defined by what you see and hear and, and, and can sense. No, some things just continue to be true whether or not you can see them. Now, we've all learned this idea of object permanence. We know that if someone walks out of the room, they're going to walk right back in. They didn't just cease existing just because we don't see them anymore. The disciples were grown adults. They also knew about object permanence. But Jesus really seems to be treating them kind of like babies here. It's almost like he's describing the game of peekaboo to them. It's for a very good reason, however. He needed to teach them that this idea of object permanence applies especially to God. It's a lesson they had to learn, and it's a lesson we would do well to pay attention to also. See, at times in our lives, we have tremendous sorrow. But this does not mean that God is not with us during these times. 
It does not negate all the things that Jesus did for us on this earth, and it also does not negate the joy which we have waiting for us at the end of the tunnel. Our theme for this morning is what to expect when you're expecting eternal life. Expect sin-induced sorrow for a little while. Expect Jesus-birthed joy forever. A life is truly filled with opposites, sorrow and joy, pain and pleasure. You really see all of these things come to fruition when you're raising a child. You can have a, a son who's running happily through the hallway, screaming with glee, and suddenly he trips on a toy and falls, and those screams turn into screams of, of agony and pain. You can have a daughter who's crying just because, well, that's what babies do. And then suddenly those cries really quickly turn into laughs when mama starts making faces at her. It's a theme that runs throughout our text as well. We have a life filled with both sorrow but also joy at the same time. Jesus wants to prepare his disciples for this. He's preparing them, especially at the beginning of our text, to be ready for sorrow when it comes. He says in the first verse, A little while, and you will see me no longer. And again, a little while, and you will see me. Any idea what he's referring to? It's not peekaboo. Well, if I set the context for you, perhaps if you don't already know, you'll know then. This is the night in which Jesus is going to be betrayed. He's in the upper room with his disciples. They're about to celebrate the Lord's Supper, and you know exactly everything that's going to happen after that. So you probably know what he's referring to here. He's talking about his suffering and his death, and then his resurrection. A little while, and you will see me no longer, because he would be dead and in the grave. And then a little while, and you will see me, because he would rise and see them face to face. And then Jesus says in verse 20, Truly I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. Just a couple Sundays ago, our gospel reading spoke about the event that took place when their sorrow turned into joy. You remember, the disciples were in the upper room. They were meeting together, and they were sorrowful. Their master, who they just spent their last three years following, had died. They saw him buried. They, they knew for certain that he was in the ground. And now they were all alone. Do you remember when they were in the upper room, they had locked the doors and were told they locked them out of fear of the Jews? It was a scary time to be a follower of Christ. But then imagine how that sorrow turns into joy, just as Jesus says, when all of a sudden Jesus stood in their midst and he showed them his hands and his feet and his side and he said, peace be with you. He was right. A little while and you would see me and a little while your sorrow will turn into joy. How joyous they must have been realizing that their Savior had risen from the dead, just as he said. But not everything was quite right. See, Thomas wasn't there, first of all. The very next Sunday, we're told that Thomas was there along with the rest of the disciples. They were in the upper room again. And what had they done? Yet again, they had locked the doors. We can assume it was still out of fear from the Jews. Yeah, Jesus had risen. They did have joy. They did rejoice knowing that their Savior did not remain in the ground, but he had risen and that they also would rise. But they had not yet risen to heaven. They were still here on earth. And because they were still stuck on a sinful earth, they still had, cont had to contend with people who wanted to kill them. They still had to contend with very real sorrow and suffering. And as such, they were there yet again in an upper room behind locked doors still dealing with the sorrow that the world had to throw at them. Now, just a few weeks ago, we celebrated Easter, which truly is the, the, the pinnacle of the church year. It was a really you know, wonderful Sunday, I thought. You know, can't really get much better than an Easter song service, and we had almost 80 people in the pews here, and it was probably about the best singing I've ever heard in these walls. A really great Sunday. The type of Sunday that can carry you on through, through several weeks afterwards with the joy of Easter behind you. But it's not long at all until the joy of Easter starts to subside and we get caught up with the sorrow of life yet again. We're still here. 
we still suffer. The world still rejoices against us, and we still sorrow because of it. Even though Christ shed his blood to pay for your sins, and even though he rose from the dead to take away your sins and to take away death from you, while you're here on this earth and you still have sinful flesh clinging to you, you can know that you're still going to be sorrowful. You're still going to suffer. The temptation for us in dealing with these things is to start comparing ourselves to one another. We start to think things like, why, aren't any, why isn't anyone else suffering like me? Why do I have so much more trouble in my life than anyone else? God, why are you singling me out? What did I do to deserve this? The truth is, you are not alone in your suffering. You're not alone for two reasons. First of all, you're not alone because all Christians suffer and deal with sorrow. We spoke about it last week. Jesus himself said, A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If you are a Christian, you are struggling. If not now, you will soon. Sometimes we try to hide it. In our pride, we want people to think that our lives are just hunky-dory, but the truth is, we all suffer. We all have sorrow. And maybe you're thinking, okay, sure, we all suffer, but I'm suffering the worst. Well, consider what God says in 1 Corinthians 10. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape so that you may be able to bear it. Your particular suffering or struggle is common to man. Every single other person in these walls today is suffering and facing real sorrow that is common to to man. This isn't to downplay anyone's particular struggle at this moment, but it is to show us and encourage us that we are not alone, that we are surrounded by brothers and sisters in Christ who can relate to us, who have experienced the same thing as us, and who are there to hear us and to encourage us. So you're not alone in your sorrow because you have fellow Christians with you, first of all. Second of all, and more importantly, you are not alone in your suffering. Because Jesus is with you. See, Christ is the one who has tailor-made all of our suffering to fit us perfectly. He is the one who knows exactly what we need, and he promises that he won't allow us to be tempted beyond what we can bear. But he came to take your place on the cross. He came to suffer the pains of hell and death for you. He came to painstakingly create peace between you and God, where before it had been just entirely enmity. And he didn't do all that just so that he could just step back now from your life and let the pieces fall where they may. No, God says that he counts every single hair on your head. That means he's paying attention to the details of your life. That he's very aware of everything that's happening to you, everything that you're going through, and he's using it for his good purpose, to bring you closer to him. We just read, with the temptation, he gives the way of escape so that you may be able to bear it. Do you know what the way of escape is during times of sorrow? It's not that he'll just strengthen your resolve. It's not that he'll just make you mentally tough to be able to bear with it. It's not that he'll just soon enough make it all pass by and, and you'll be able to deal once again. Your way of escape in times of sorrow is Jesus. And it's only Jesus. Jesus is the way of escape. He can overcome your sorrow because he's already overcome all sorrow. All that is present in our life due to sin it's already been taken care of. He tells us, you will sorrow, but it will only last a little while. It can't be permanent because the only thing that will last, the only thing that is permanent, is the joy which he has afforded us through our resurrection. And he says, no one can take that joy from you. So you will have sorrow here for a little while. You can expect it. But you can also expect joy. 
that abides to eternal life. Now, Jesus gives us the best illustration that illustrates this, this suffering and joy dichotomy. In verse 21, he says, When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. You know, outside of death itself, there really is no better example of, of the, the, the damage that sin has done to mankind than in childbirth. We kind of take childbirth for granted now. You know, it's, it's so routine now for our doctors and for our advanced medicine that we don't really realize that childbirth is extremely dangerous. It's extremely painful too, as many of us know. It wasn't supposed to be the case, though. It was only after the fall into sin that God told Eve, in pain you shall bring forth children. That pain, it's a consequence of sin. That sorrow is only here because we have sin in the world. But God uses this pain and suffering to bring joy, to bring new life into the world. And Jesus is right when he says that she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. Now, our suffering and sorrow is very similar to childbirth. It's very real. It can be very painful, and it is very dangerous. But it leads to something far greater than all of that. Eternal joy with the Lord. That's his purpose through it all. The purpose of our struggle and our suffering and sorrow is so that the Lord can bring us closer to him, so that we stop looking to ourselves for strength, and start leaning entirely on him. So when you face sorrow, this is how you deal with it. Let's take cancer, for example. You don't need to pretend that cancer is a gift from God. You also don't need to believe that cancer is a curse from God that he's sending in your life to punish you for some sin. Neither of those things are true. We simply call a spade a spade. Cancer afflicts the world because sin is in the world. It is a result of sin. Because cancer is a result of sin, we are free to hate cancer and to despise it. And we're also free to lean on Jesus through the course of cancer or if someone else has cancer that we love. We are free to call upon Jesus and ask for his grace and trust that God is correct when he says that death is now just the gate to life immortal and that God is not lying to us when he says that he can work all things together, even cancer, for our good. When you're suffering, you don't have to pretend that everything is okay and that you have a perfect, perfect faith and that you'll never waver. What you can do is trust in God. Wait on him. Pray for his grace and trust that he will be good to you for his son's sake. Because his son took away all of your sin and only Jesus can take away all of the effects of sin also like cancer and death and all of the sorrow that afflicts us in our lives. Now, Jesus is preparing the disciples for all of these things. He's trying to warn them, you're going to have sorrow. I don't want that to overcome you. The problem was the disciples were rather confused. They didn't totally understand what he was talking about, and they weren't sure what was coming for them. Notice how Jesus did not want them to remain confused. Without them even asking, he goes and tells them exactly what he means by it. He goes and reassures them that, the sorrow will only last a little while, and then their joy will be full afterwards. In the same way, we can be confused at times about our sorrow and our suffering. We can ask God questions, why? Why me? What are you doing to me? God doesn't want you to be confused either. The only way in which we can come through suffering and sorrow is through the truth. It's through Jesus giving us the answers. And this is the truth when it comes to suffering, that whatever you're dealing with, it's only going to last a little while. Because soon enough, you will see him and you will rejoice. Just as a mother gives birth to a child and quickly forgets about the pain, 
God promises you that soon enough you will have eternal joy in heaven and you'll forget about all of the sorrows of this life. We also know that even when we lose a loved one, we'll sorrow, we'll miss them, but that will only last a little while as well. And soon enough we will rejoice to see them in heaven also because of Jesus. So all of this earthly sorrow, it only lasts a little while. And then it gives way to joy in eternity. But you don't have to wait until eternity to have joy and to rejoice. You don't have to wait until heaven to finally see this joy. No, you can see it right now, just as the disciples did. Like the disciples, we can rejoice, knowing that regardless of what the world throws at us, it cannot take us out of our Savior's hands. No matter how much the world rejoices at our shortcomings and our failures and hates God, no one can go back in time and stop Jesus from dying on the cross for your sins. No one can go back in time and, and prevent Jesus from rising from the dead. These are accomplished facts. And because of that, your sins, though many, have been forgiven. This is also accomplished. Your name has been written in the book of eternal life. This also is a fact. We can rejoice in these things. Because even now, in the midst of turmoil, they remain true and certain. We can rejoice because no one can take them away from us. So at the outset, we spoke about the game of peekaboo. How a, a mommy teaches a child that even if she goes into the other room, you don't need to cry. I'm still there. I'm still coming back. It's important for a child to learn that even if she can't see her mommy's face, her mommy's still there. How much more true that is of our Father in heaven. Even when we are facing our darkest days, and it seems like we can't see God at all, and we question whether he's even with us at all, God reassures us he is still there. He's still with us. He's still working to prepare a place for us in heaven. He's still working to ensure that we get there. See, God knows that every good game of peekaboo ends in the same way. Peekaboo, I see you. And in our relationship with God, that's really the important thing. That God sees us. That he watches out for us. That he sees everything we do, all of our sins, and yet he chooses to forgive us. He chooses to pass over our sins because he's chosen to love us. And now he spends every single moment of your life interacting to bring you closer to him. And he's patiently waiting until the day when we also will see him with our own eyes. Through Jesus Christ, that day will soon come. And it'll only be a little while until it's here. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may remain seated. And the peace of God, which surpasses all our human understanding, will guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.